We're going to start with a pop quiz today. Um, it might age a few of you. I'm sorry for that in advance. Uh, there's been great poetry throughout all of history. It's just a, a thing that defines humanity. Some of you will know this poem, I think, and so this is interactive. Uh, when I, I'm going to read three stanzas of the poem, and then I'm going to ask you to, to not cry out, but to speak out the fourth stanza of this poem. Um, the poem goes like this. It's a work of art. It says, And I am whatever you say I am. If I wasn't, then why would I say I am? In the paper, the news, every day I am. Does anybody know what comes next? No? Starts the word radio. Any? The radio won't even play my jams. I, see, come on, we're, we're so uncultured here. I thought we would do better on this. Uh, Marshall Mathers is the name of the poet. Also named, known as Eminem. There's a follow-up question, though. This is for you to guess. Like, seeing as the radio would not play his jams, where do you suppose I heard that poem for the very first time? If you had to guess. I heard it on the radio. Yeah. Isn't that ironic? That although he claims the radio wouldn't play his jams, that that's... I thought it was ironic. Never mind. Um, what you've witnessed now is... Uh, this is... Sermon writing fatigue at its finest. You're, like, it's just like, as I'm done. I'm like cooked. I'm like the Reds. It's just over. I'm like, I'm like the Reds pitching staff. I'm exhausted. I'm done. I'm tapping out. It, I, that's, that's a joke. I'm still with us here. Here comes the Jesus juke, though, right? If, if uh, Jesus could say that about the words of Matthew. That's been Matthew's claim the whole time. So Jesus is the promised Messiah. He is the one that was promised of old, and, and here He is. He's here. And today as we close out volume one of our Matthew series, so we're doing Matthew in seven volumes. We're about to take a pause for a few weeks, and we'll jump back in to, to volume two of the sermon series. We're closing out chapter three of the book of Matthew. And the point of all three chapters, the overarching point that Matthew wants his audience to see is that Jesus is the promised Messiah. That Jesus is who he says he is. That Jesus could say that he is exactly who Matthew says he is. That's been the point. That's why Matthew keeps pointing back to the Old Testament, saying, remember this prophecy? Remember these words? They were about me, and now you see them coming true. And now today, and you just saw a preview of it, we're going to actually hear God himself speak audibly, affirming that Jesus is exactly who he claims to be. If I was to sum up chapters 1 through 3 and, and sum up what we'll see today, I would say this. Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promises. We've seen that through all the chapters. He's the fullness of God's righteousness. We'll see that today. And this is the kicker, and this is, I hope, what encourages our hearts deeply today, that Jesus is the object of God's great pleasure. Father, today, what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Verse 13 of chapter 3 then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized. Jesus has traveled 70 miles to get here. 70 mile journey on foot to roll up to where John the Baptist is in the wilderness baptizing people in his camel skin jacket and honey and locust, you know, breath because that's his diet. Jesus comes. This is the first time we've seen him in person in the book of Matthew since he was just a boy. Coming back from Egypt where he had fled when Herod was killing all the firstborn or all the, uh, the young children, male children in Bethlehem. 
He comes back from Egypt. He, he uh, settles in Nazareth with his family. And all that Matthew has written till now is building up to this moment when John the Baptist stands there, probably waist deep in the Jordan River, preaching the gospel of repentance to all those who are coming out to hear him. And Jesus comes walking over the horizon. And here he comes. We've seen a lot about Jesus in these first three chapters. Quickly, we started with the lineage, his, his line. That uh, kind of boring part of Matthew to most people in that we saw all this host of names, the, the great-great-grandmothers and great-great-grandfathers, etc., of Jesus. And we saw that God is, has, in, has sovereign intentionality in all things, that he's faithful, keeping his promise to see a Messiah be brought into the world who would die in the place of sinners like you and sinners like me. In the birth of Jesus, we, we saw the fulfillment of a promise that God would tabernacle with us, that he would be, become a God incarnate, God with skin on, and that he would dwell amongst his people. In the narrative of the wise men, remember there are these Foreigners, they're, they're not Jews, but God had promised that through the descendants of Abraham would come someone who would bless the nations, and now the wise men come from afar and they worship Jesus, fulfilling that promise that, Jesus, that through Jesus the nations of the world would be blessed. Even in the darkness of what happens when Herod kills all the firstborn children, even in that, we see God fulfilling His promise by taking Jesus to Egypt and, and, draw, and then drawing him out. Out of Egypt I have called my son. And we, as we walked through that passage, we saw three major promises that were fulfilled in that time of Jesus' life. We've seen Jesus as the better Adam. We've seen Jesus as the promised child of Abraham. As Matthew points us back to the Old Testament, we've seen him as the promised son of David. We've seen him as the better Moses, the hope of the nations. The promised Messiah, the God who is with us. We've seen all of that fulfilled in the young life of, of Jesus. And then last week we met John the Baptist, the last great messianic prophet, preparing the way for the Messiah, for the Savior, Jesus. The last great messianic or prophet of the Messiah before the Messiah arrives. And he points us to Jesus. And he really wanted us to understand something, something really important the kingdom of God, it, there's no neutrality with Jesus. It's clear, you're either in or you're out. You're either out rejecting Jesus as king, and destruction and, and death is yours. And that's the hard reality that John the Baptist preached. Or you're in. Embracing Jesus as king. And with that, the kingdom is yours. Remember last week, John was a little harsh. It was a hard, hard words to listen to. He drew clear and concise lines, those who are in the kingdom and those who aren't. But what we've seen over and over and over again is that Jesus is the fulfillment of the promises of God. And what we do with Jesus matters deeply. Because what Jesus is doing in the world as we will go through the book of Matthew is the most important thing that's ever happened in human history. So what we do with Jesus matters. We watch the next scene play out, and as we do, we see that Jesus is not just the fulfillment of God's promises, He's the fullness of God's righteousness. Verses 14 and 15, John would have prevented Him. John says, no, I don't think so. I'm not going to baptize you. That Jesus says, I'm here to be baptized. John says, no, you're not. Right? Like, I'm preparing the way for you, Jesus. There's humility here in, in John saying that. He's not, he's not being rude. He's not like trying to be uh, disobedient or, or uh, have dissension. He's being humble saying, I need to be baptized by you, he says. You're the Savior, not me. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, 
Let it be so, for this is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, John, consented. There's a few things we see here. The main point, and we'll come right back to it, is that Jesus is the fullness of, of God's righteousness. I'll explain what that means. But I don't want us to skip over John's humility. He, he sets an example for us with his humility because he knows who he is and he knows who he isn't. See, humility is, is not woe is me. Humility is rightly assessing yourself for who you are. Humility isn't thinking that you're just filled with weakness. Humility is knowing your strengths and your weaknesses. John knew who he, who he was. He knows his role. He knows his place. He's not here to build his own brand. He's here to prepare the way for, for Jesus. And he knows that he's different than Jesus in one major way. Which brings us to Jesus' holiness. Jesus is perfect. John is not. Jesus is without sin. John is not. The author of Hebrews recognized this. Uh, he says, For we do not have a high priest, speaking of Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every aspect or every respect has been tempted as we are. He's experienced suffering. He's experienced temptation, but yet without sin. Jesus, holy, perfect, no sin. The only human to ever walk the face of the planet Earth without sin. Peter recognized it too. He was with Jesus. When he writes his epistle of 1 Peter 2, 21 and 22, he, he says some interesting words. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. But then he tells us something that he knows to be true of Jesus because he lived with him. He says he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Now this should be interesting if you were here last week because John the Baptist's messaging about his baptism has been very strong, that it is a baptism of repentance. And repentance is only needed if you have sinned. And Jesus has not sin. That's why John hesitates. He says, like the messaging of this baptism, what I've been proclaiming very, very powerfully is that this is a baptism of repentance and here you are, the Son of God, perfect in all of your ways. Why must I baptize you with this baptism? Jesus has nothing to repent for. Be clear of that. But Jesus says there's something greater happening in this baptism, something important that the world needs to see. You see, Jesus is going to be an example for us. Jesus is going to say, follow in my steps. Do what I do. Live like I live. And he doesn't just talk the talk. He walks the walk. He, he shows us how to live. Hear me, if the perfect Son of God postures Himself in humility, which He does entering into this baptism. Although he is without sin, he still humbles himself to the baptism of John. How much more should we humble ourselves and posture ourselves with humility, those of us who are full of sin? Me, right? Like full of sin. Like one day I'll just bring my kids up here and they can tell you how their week went. And you'll just see, like, so like if me, full of sin, Jesus, perfect. Jesus postures Himself with humility. How much more should we? He sets us that example. He shows us the way. He associates Himself with the people of, of God. Again, He's leading the way. Jesus is, is leading the way. This is the kind of leader you really want to follow, by the way. I know, I know we get wrapped up in those who present themselves as powerful, those who present themselves as strong, those who present themselves as you know, having great branding or whatever it is. We get, we get wrapped up in leaders like this, but if you've ever been in a tough spot with a leader, the type of leader you want is someone who can admit when, when they're wrong, who can humble themselves, who can adjust as they need to, right? And although Jesus has done nothing wrong, He still postures Himself with humility, with humbleness. This is the type of leader you can be authentic with. This is the type of leader that you can follow into the, the darkest places, knowing that he is a safe and good and strong leader. He's saying to us that this is what it is to be a child of God. 
To be a child of God, he's also affirming the baptism of John. That's a real when when the Savior of the world participates in your baptism, it brings some validity to that that ministry. He's affirming that repentance is the way. He's, He's showing that, that the true children of God humble ourselves before God in hope of His kingdom. So he's setting an example of, righteous, uh, or of righteousness, and he actually is perfect righteousness. Here's another aspect of it. There's not a specific prophecy about Jesus' baptism that we can point back to, but I can promise you this. If Jesus did it, it's because God wanted him to, God the Father. Remember Jesus in the garden, he's preparing to die on the cross, and, and he prays out. It says he's sweating drops of blood. Like, he's just so... Right? Like, if you think Jesus, like, didn't feel pain, then you haven't really read the Gospels. He's in the pain of about to be on the cross. He's, he's in this extremely vulnerable moment before his Father in heaven. And he says, uh, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. Jesus is modeling o- obedience for us. He's, he's associating with the people of God, calling us to follow God in righteousness and to walk in His steps to do the will of God. The last thing I would ask you to notice here is the condescending requirements of fulfilling all righteousness. By that I mean, like by, by condescension, I don't mean like we think of that term like condescending, like looking down on someone. The Bible uses it as coming down, making oneself smaller, making oneself humble, making oneself low to be with others. And that's what Jesus does. Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This is Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. He doesn't hold on to his position and cling to it and say, I can't let people see me being weak. He doesn't hold on to it like that. He he does not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And, and, And if you've ever been a part of a baptism... What is most frequently said as the person is buried in the water, they say, buried with Christ in his death, raised with him in his resurrection. Jesus in his baptism is pointing us to that depth of humility that will be his when he goes to the cross and dies in our place and is raised to newness of life. Jesus is the fulfillment of all God's promises. We saw that in chapters 1 through 3. And Jesus is the fullness of God's righteousness, obedient to all God commands, faithful every step of the way, perfect, holy, humble, loving. Here's the last piece. Jesus is the object of God's great pleasure. Remember, we've heard prophet after prophet affirming that Jesus is the Messiah, before, right, like that's the thing about prophecy. It's affirming the reality of Jesus before Jesus even comes onto the scene. And then Jesus, as he lives, everyone looks at his life and says, yeah, those prophets were right, and here he is. Here's the Messiah. So we've heard from these prophets throughout the first three chapters over and over again, almost like a broken record. Matthew keeps saying this happened so it could be fulfilled, or this happened because the prophet said, pointing back, pointing back, pointing back. But now the affirmation comes in real time, And it doesn't come from a prophet. It comes from God Himself. Verses 16 and 17. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately He went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened. And He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on Him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is My beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Note a few things. You you see the Trinity there? Did you notice that? A careful eye sees God the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove land on the shoulder of God the Son, Jesus who is in the water, and then the heavens open up. Who knows what that even looked like? Maybe light shines down, I don't know. But uh, the voice of God the Father speaks from heaven. This great doctrine, this 
mysterious doctrine, this hard-to-grasp doctrine that, that there is one God and three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That reality is beheld in those verses. We see the Trinity right there. Note more important, well, not more importantly, but more to John or Matthew's point, the affirmation of Jesus that comes from the Father. Remember, that's primarily what these three chapters have been about. Matthew wants everyone to know Jesus is who he says he is. Jesus is the one who was promised. He's the Messiah. Now it's affirmed by God himself. The words of God the Father here, though, are not a new message. He spoke these words through the psalmist in chapter 2. He said something similar. I will tell you the decree the Lord said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. You are my son, prophetically speaking of the Messiah. Isaiah 42, 1, Behold my servant whom I, whom I uphold, my chosen, and whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Again, you have to understand the context. We read these stories. We're not saturated in Old Testament teachings like the Jewish people would have been. Those who were there and heard this voice from heaven, God the Father, say those words, would have thought back to Psalm 2-7, would have thought back to Isaiah 42-1. They would have remembered those words, right? So it would have been this retroactive affirmation of these prophecies and also the very voice of God saying He is who He says He is. Matthew's been building to this. The lineage of Abraham and David, the words of Isaiah and Micah and Jeremiah. The echoes of Moses and Samuel and Elijah and Samson. We, we've seen those throughout these three chapters. And the prophetic ministry of John the Baptist. You talk about great endorsements, by the way. Have you ever read a book that's got like a bunch of endorsements and you open up the first page and maybe there's a couple pages of endorsements? I mean, you want like legit people to be on the endorsement page. Like nobody's ever asked me for an endorsement because it's worthless, means nothing. You get, you get somebody that's got some substance, some meaning, some, some, some knowledge that's known as legit to write the endorsements. And this guy's got, Jesus already has Abraham and David. He's already got Jeremiah and Micah and Isaiah. He's already got Moses and Samuel and Elijah and Samson. I mean, you talk about a, some heavy-hitting in, endorsements. But in case you're still not convinced... Matthew says, remember that God himself spoke directly from heaven, affirming that Jesus is who he says he is. The kingdom is here. Jesus is exactly the one. Here's why it's good for our souls. I want you to notice, lastly, the pleasure of God with his son. God doesn't say, this is my awesome son here to kick butt and take names. He could have said that, I mean, maybe not in that verbiage, but he could have said maybe something more poetically to that end, and it would have been true. He doesn't say, this is my holy son here to show you how it's done, although that would have been true as well. He doesn't say, this is my brilliant son, just wait till you hear him teach. Right? Melt your faces off with his parables. It's going to blow your mind. It just would have been true. But he doesn't say it. He doesn't say, here's my powerful son. Let the healings begin. Just wait till you see. Right? Water to wine. You talk about making you popular. Right? No. The Father emphasizes this. He's my beloved son. I delight in him. I am well pleased with him. Like a gushing father, God the Father says, Have you seen my boy? Have you seen this guy? He makes my heart melt. He's my world, my heartbeat. I love him. He makes me so happy. That's the message. <laughs> this is more awesome than it may appear at face value. This should make your heart beat a little faster because yes, Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promises. Yes, He is the fullness of God's righteousness. But as the object of God's great 
pleasure, we find something so good for our souls. I, I, hear me today. God's pleasure with you is contingent on His pleasure with His Son. Notice what I didn't say. I did not say God's pleasure with you is contingent on you getting it right. God's pleasure with you is contingent on you living a good life, being morally excellent, knowing the right people, praying the right prayers, giving the right amount. But that's not... God's pleasure in you is contingent on His... Pleasure in His Son. Now watch this. Father, please may this rest on Your people's hearts today. Empower. I can't make it rest on their hearts today. Please make it rest on their hearts today. John chapter 17, verses 24 through 26. Jesus is praying for you. Okay. He's about to die. It's called His High Priestly Prayer. He prays for His disciples directly. And then He prays for all those who will believe in Him. All those who will one day follow Jesus. Hear Jesus pray for you. Please hear Jesus pray for you. He says, Father, I desire that they also, whom You have given Me, may be with Me where I am, to see My glory that You have given to Me because, and He cites the love of the Father, because You loved Me before the foundations of the world. It's how long-lasting the love of the Father has been for Jesus. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know You, I know You, and these knew that You have sent Me. Know that You have sent Me. I made known to them Your name, and I will continue to make it known for what purpose? That the love with which You have loved Me may be in them and I in them. Did you see it? You're not smiling like you saw it. Jesus is praying the night before His crucifixion, and Jesus prays for all those who will ever follow Him. That includes you today if you're a Christian. And what does He pray? God the Father. You know that pleasure and delight that you have in Me, Your Son? Take that same pleasure and delight and put it into my followers. Let me make it even more clear for you today. If you're here today and you're a Christian, God loves you at the exact same level of passion, intentionality, goodness, and wholeheartedness that He loves His Son Jesus. I'm serious, like, like really, we don't fully believe that. I mean, we don't. We're seeking affirmation from at least half a dozen other sources when the God of the universe who spoke worlds into existence, who will give us an everlasting kingdom that knows no end, says, I love you at the same level I love my own son, Jesus To be loved like that? Some of us are just trying to find one human to love us like that. And we won't, by the way. Not at that level. I ain't throwing any shade on your spouse. They really love you. I'm, I, I'm sure of it, but not like that. Not that level of love. Remember in Colossians, if those of you that were here when we preached through that, there was this interesting verse where Paul speaks of Christ, he says, Christ is in me the hope of glory. That having Christ in me is my hope of eternal, everlasting joy, salvation forever and ever with God. Here we see that Christ in us is our hope of love. True, eternal, everlasting love. You are beloved at the same level Jesus. If you're a Christian, Christ is in you. He's in you. And the pleasure of God is yours. 
And the kingdom is yours, 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us? That we should be called children of God? You're His child today, His son, His daughter, if you're a Christian. Jesus is your big brother. Hear me today, you've been adopted into the family of God. I have an adopted daughter. And I'll tell you this, if you want to come up after the service and claim that I love her less than my other children, you better bring some receipts. Maybe be ready to fight me, because it ain't true. And you've been adopted into the family of God. And if you think he loves you less than Jesus, show me the receipts. You don't have them. Now, now, you might finagle the circumstances and situations of your life into a receipt because life's been hard and it's been brutal and it's beat you up and it's kicked you down. And you might think, man, I can show, here's these receipts. But, but hear me, if you could see the end, which that's why faith is required. If you could see the end, you would know that He has never left your side. He's never given up on you. He's never quit. And He's going to redeem every single one of those broken and busted things for your good and your joy. It's going to happen. At community group on Wednesday, we're reading through the, the book of Mark. One of the observations, uh, uh, one of the the ladies in our group made was this man like John the Baptist like just gave it all up. He's out there wearing camel's hair and uh, eating locusts and honey. And then we were reading, which we'll come back to this when we get back into the, the Matthew series, uh, the disciples, they're just hanging out with their father Zebedee, like about to take over the family business. They've got their futures planned for them, their security planned for them. And Jesus says, follow me. And they're like, okay. And they throw down the nets and they go. But, like what would possess someone to do something so crazy. Why would someone do something so insanely stupid on paper? I'll give you a couple reasons. We've seen them. When God with skin on shows up just as was promised and He is exactly who He claims to be, that'll make you do some crazy things. And being loved by God as his own child will lead to inexplicable, inexplicable transformation. So three questions for us. Those of you who are Christians today. Do you believe that Jesus really is who he said he is? Do I believe that Jesus really is who he said he is? Like, really? Really? Now, I'm not asking you if you like going to church. Some of you go here, so it would shock me if you do like going to church. It's a joke. I'm not asking if you like going to church. I'm not, I'm not asking if you believe there's a God. I'm not, not asking you if you check Christian on the census form. I'm asking, do you believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And I'm going to be honest with you. When we pick back up the book of Matthew and we start going through it, we're going to continue to, to see more and more that there's no neutrality in following Jesus. You're either all in or you're not. Do you believe that Jesus is who he says he is? Question two, do you believe that in Jesus the pleasure of the God of the universe rests upon you and fills you? Do you truly believe today that you are fully beloved by the God of the universe? Do you believe that today? Warts and all. Like he's seen it all. You haven't hidden anything from him. He loves you. More than you can even begin to fathom. Do you believe that because God is pleased with Jesus today, right now, He's pleased with you? And hear this. Do you believe that because God will never be displeased with Jesus, hear me, because God will never be displeased with Jesus, He will never be displeased with you. We're walking through our lives, all of us, and we mess up. 
Welcome to the club. You'll be, you're welcome here at this church. We're jacked to the core, man. And we mess up. And then we think, we think this is God's response. Oh, again, these fools. My children are so stupid. Why? Because that's how we act as parents. Sometimes, not all the time. Y'all are hitting home runs as parents, but not perfect. None of us are batting a thousand. But God as Father is batting a thousand. And He loves you. Even when you mess it all up. He's pleased with you. And He will never not be pleased with you. The third question is this, what difference does that make? Like, what difference does it make if we believe that Jesus is who He says He is and we believe that, that we're beloved by God because of Jesus? Well, I think it makes all the difference. Can you imagine Jesus, God with skin on, Jesus who spoke worlds into existence, who, who walked on the waters and calmed the seas with the sound of His voice, the promised Messiah, as we've seen, the fulfillment of all the prophecies, the fullness of God's righteousness. He says to you today, come to me, all you who labor. You've been there and are heavy laden. You've been there, come to me, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me. And in Him, the God of the universe loves you unconditionally. And the kingdom is yours, Luke 12, 32. Fear not, little flock, Jesus says. It's my dad's good pleasure. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. What difference does it make? To be a disciple of Jesus is to be shaped by this true narrative. To be shaped by the reality that you are loved by God unconditionally forever, no matter what. So we learn in that love not to fear what the world fears. Not to love what the world loves. Not to strive for what the world strives for. Not to sing what the world sings. Not to covet what the world covets. Not to make ourselves busy with what the world is busy with. We're reshaped holistically from the inside out by this reality, by this true narrative. We're beloved by God and part of an unshakable, eternal king. This sets us free. We don't have to be enslaved by the love of money or the love of power or the love of control or desperation for affirmation. We can be authentic and honest and generous and pure, and servants. And we can boldly and joyfully invite others into the kingdom and into the love of God. This changes everything. Is it changing everything in your life? Is it changing everything in your life? Is it changing the way you do work, the way you do family, the way you do neighboring? Is it changing the way you do sports and the way you do social media and the way you do sexuality and generosity and relationships? Like every piece of who you are, is it, is it being changed? By that? The way you do every single thing. I'm not asking if you're perfect like Jesus. You'd be the first <laughs> since Jesus. So it's, you're not. I'm not asking if you're perfect like Jesus and all those things. I'm asking, are you changing? It might be slow change. Have you met me? Right? Like it's slow change. But true change. As you become more and more shaped by the true narrative that Jesus is who he says he is. And because of him, you are loved by God unconditionally. If you're not a Christian, the pleasure of God can be yours today. Fully yours today through the finished work of Jesus on the cross that's the gospel message the gospel message isn't do more 
The gospel message isn't be more. The gospel message isn't get your life together. The gospel message is God so loved the world, that love, that unconditional love, that he sent the one he loved the most, his son Jesus, to die on the cross so that he then could make it possible through his shed blood for you to be made right with God so then he could love you the same as he loves his son. That's the message of the gospel. You know what isn't a part of that? You being perfect to get God to love you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. The work is finished. Jesus did it on the cross. Believe on the finished work of Jesus on the cross and you will be saved. Today, after this service, my wife, uh, we're celebrating her birthday at my house. You're not invited, sorry. It's a human I love the most on the planet. Lunch, the clock's ticking once this is over. I will skip her birthday to talk to you about what it means to become a Christian. I don't want anything more in the entire world. There's someone in this room that is not sure they're a Christian. Will you please stay? Hey, I know it can take a boatload of courage to walk up to this knucklehead and be like, man, what's it mean to be a Christian? But I would love to have that conversation with you. Father, thank you so much that you love us unconditionally. There is no end to your love. That you are pleased with your children because of Jesus. So the sins I, of even my morning, this morning, have not turned you away from me. Because you see me through the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Father, make us know your love more than we did before we walked in here. Make us know that the kingdom is ours. And may that transform our lives holistically from the inside out. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.